please the court, I appear on behalf of the claimant in this case, Mr Morgan, and the defendant appears in person. This is an application inviting the court to strike out the defendant's defence pursuant to CPR 3.4. Alternatively, we would ask the court to grant summary judgment on the entirety of the claim brought pursuant to CPR 24.2. Sir, can I confirm, have you had sight of the papers? And have you had a chance to also read through the skeleton argument provided? I'm grateful. Sir, as you will see, I have set out the facts for this case between paragraphs three to seven in the skeleton and do not intend on going through these again unless you require any further clarification. I'm grateful. So the parties are not in agreement in this case and I propose to present my submissions in the following way. Firstly, dealing with the application to strike out, which you will see begins at paragraph 13 of my skeleton argument. Following this will be the application for summary judgment, uh, which begins from paragraph 16. So in relation to the application to strike out, I intend on persuading the court to strike out the defendant's defence on the basis that there are no reasonable grounds for defending this claim and that it may also be an abuse of the court's process. As regards to summary judgment, I intend on demonstrating that there is also no real prospect of successfully defending this claim and that there is also no other compelling reason to allow the claim to proceed. For the purpose of ease and clarity as well, sir, I will be discussing these elements with reference to relevant case law, although uh, I do realise that there may be some degree of similarity between these two applications and where possible I will be avoiding any substantial repetition. Now, if I may, sir, move on to the application to strike out. Uh, you will see I have set out the test for strike out uh, pursuant to CPR 3.4 subsection 2A and B at paragraph 9 of the skeleton, and the court will be familiar with the test. The test also discloses three occasions where strike out may be necessary, uh, but in my submission I focus on subsection A, uh, 2A and 2B. Uh, and also practice direction 3A also provides additional guidance when considering the test. Firstly, with discussing the first element of the test uh, under which this application to strike out may succeed, CPR 3.4A states that the court may strike out a statement of case where it discloses no reasonable grounds for bringing or defending the claim. And specifically, paragraph 1.6 of practice direction 3A, sir, states that where the defence consists of a bare denial or otherwise sets out no coherent statement of facts or where the facts where which set out are, which set out are coherent, but even, even if are true, um, do not amount in law to a defence of the claim. And so at this point, it may be helpful to have a copy of the defence in front of you. We submit that this case uh, would fall directly under practice direction 3A paragraph 1.6 in that the defence is incoherent and makes no sense and also that even if it were to be found to be coherent it could not amount in law to a defence and we submit this for the following reasons. I'm currently at paragraph 13 of the skeleton sir. The defendant merely discloses that the claimant does not deserve the outstanding balance of £10,500, but fails to identify a term within the contract which in fact was breached. Specifically, the defendant goes on to make no mention of any duties uh, possibly owed under the Supply of Goods and Services Act 1982 and any breach uh, respectively from that act. It is therefore our submission that there if there is to be any damage, no evidence has yet been adduced by the defendant to prove that those damages are in fact owed. And accordingly, the defendant discloses no reasonable ground for defending this claim, and it should in fact be struck out in our submission. As to my second submission, sir, in relation to the application to strike out, this is pursuant to subsection 2B of the test being that the statement of case can be struck out if it's an abuse of the court's process or is otherwise likely to obstruct the just disposal of proceedings. So to provide some guidance, um, CPR 3.4.2 in uh, the white book 
The commentary provides that there is no dividing line between subsection A and B, and a statement of case which discloses no reasonable ground, um, as mentioned before, may also constitute an abuse of the court's process. And on the facts, it is my submission that this claim may be struck out on the basis of an abuse of courts process of the court's process. So I'm at paragraph 14 of the skeleton. Considering all of the circumstances in this case, the defendant accepted the repudiatory breach of the contract, the non-payment of the outstanding money, and the failure to demonstrate any differences between the Healy build and the actual building works that were completed. And this in my submission suggests that the claim will not require any further investigation at trial. We submit that this would therefore constitute an abuse of, abuse of the court's process. Defending the claim would also be with complete disregard um, to the overriding objective and would be an, an inappropriate use of the court's resources, uh, which would uh, be, be in breach of CPR 1.1, the overriding objective. So to strike out on this ground, there has to be an abuse and striking out must be supportive of the overriding objective. And thus it's on this basis that we in fact submit um, that to allow the defendant's defense would be in fact contrary to the overriding objective. So the court may consider allowing the defendant to also uh, have an opportunity to amend the defense to the claim. However, this would go beyond putting a technical defect right in my submission. And if any previously in, um, omitted information were to be added, this would still be unlikely to establish a defense of the claim. And so it is on these submissions uh, that I request that the court strike out the entirety of the defendant's defense. However, if the court is not with me on these points, I request that the court in the alternative consider the application for summary judgment. So if I may, just moving on to the application for summary judgment. Again, I have set out the test within the skeleton argument at paragraph 10 for summary judgment, which would be pursuant to CPR 24.2. And again, the court will be familiar with the test for summary judgment, namely that there must be no real prospect of successfully defending the claim and that there must also be no other compelling reason why this, um, this case should be disposed of at trial. In relation to the first issue, I would like to just uh, invite the court to volume one of the white book, particularly 24.2.3, uh, which summarises the principles the court must apply when considering the test, which has also been approved by the case of AC Ward and Sons and Catlin. So the law on this point um, states that real prospect means that the court must consider whether a, a claimant has um, a realistic or uh, as opposed to fanciful prospect of success, or in our case, the defendant. Uh, and this was heard in the case of Swain and Hillman. And a realistic claim is one which carries some degree of conviction, meaning that the claim is more than merely arguable. And uh, we're aware that the burden is on the applicant to prove that there is, in fact, no real prospect. And, uh, of course, granting summary judgment is at the court's discretion um, upon both parts of the test being satisfied. And it's on this basis sir, that in my submission, there is no real prospect um, of the defendant defending this claim, as there has been no evidence provided as to that fact. Although whilst notice was uh, given pursuant to CPR 24.5, the court doesn't usually allow cases to go forward simply because there is the possibility of further evidence being produced. And this was uh, in fact seen in ICI Chemicals and Polymers Limited and TTE Training Limited, uh, where I stated this at paragraph 17B uh, of the skeleton, sir. In any event, uh, we submit that it would in fact be a challenge to obtain further evidence for the defendant uh, for trial as the reason of failing to pay the outstanding sum seems not to be an issue of breach sir but rather an ill-founded accusation as the defendant's claim um defendant's case is bad in law there can be no real prospect of defending said claim in my submission where the defense is also bound to fail as to a point of law this would also make it quite difficult to establish a real prospect of success. 
And in this case, uh, the weak construction of the defence demonstrates that the claim is bound to fail. And so to assist in reaching a conclusion, the court will know that it's not being asked to conduct a mini trial, as it were, but it should not accept at face value factual propositions from the defendant where there is no substantial, there is no substantial point or there is no substance in what is being said. So as to my second submission um, on the application for summary judgment, I'm at paragraph 18 of the skeleton, which states the test, uh, the second element of the test being that there must also be no other compelling reason why the case or issue should be disposed of at trial. And it's uh, on this point, sir, that it's my submission that nothing in fact in this case provides a compelling reason why the case should in fact be disposed of at trial. If the, if the defendant were to claim that bad faith is involved, this would be an issue determinable without trial. And if there were to be uh, any jury decision in favour of the defendant, this would likely be set aside on appeal because a jury properly directed would not find in favour of the defendant based on the evidence or lack of evidence, as I should say. The claim, therefore, in my submission, raises no other triable issue uh, and therefore does not prevent the court from entering summary judgment on the entirety of the claim. Therefore, sir, uh, we request that the court consider this application for summary judgment in the alternative to the application for strike up for the reasons mentioned. So uh, just to draw your attention to paragraph 20 of the skeleton argument, where I offer some guidance to the fact that the defendant is acting in person. The fact that the defendant is acting in person should not mean that the court should offer any greater indulgence to him, given his lack of representation. As um, it's my submission that doing so would be with complete disregard to the balancing interests um, of both parties. And this has been heard in the case of Barton and Wright Hassel. So to conclude, uh, we request that you consider our application to strike out or in the alternative um, to grant summary judgment on the claim. And that concludes my submissions, sir.